Amen and amen. How you guys doing, Victor H. Stockton? So if you guys don't know me, let me just say this. My name is Jason Medina. Uh, I'm usually the guy that's standing like right there. Right there. I don't know if you guys can see that space. Uh, if you guys are at home, you know, there's a spot right there. Usually that's, that's, that's where I am. Uh, I'm the guitar player. Well, one of the two. The, the other guy's not as handsome as I am. He's my brother. It's okay. It's okay. I can say that. I can say that. He's my brother. But, um, yeah. Uh, I just would like to say that I feel honored. To be honest, I feel honored to be even behind this pulpit. I feel privileged and excited, honestly, because I don't think, honestly, I, I, I didn't know when I would be back here. Matter of fact, I wasn't even chasing this. It's not my desire. My desire is just to serve God, just to be a voice for God, just to exalt Him. And, and, and wherever God wants to take me, God take me. And tonight, we are. <laughs> Come on now. But, worship team, you guys are good. We're going to go ahead and go right on into this. And uh, if you guys could do me a favor, open up your Bibles. Huh. We're going to go into the book of First Samuel, chapter 14. When you got it, say, I got it. Man, it seems like most of you are there. All right. So, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, and the Word of God reads. Oh, well, I didn't even say before. I, I didn't even say which verse. So, it's going to be verse 1 all the way through to 7. Here we go. Now, the Word of God reads. One day, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost." But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped at the outskirts of Gibeah around the pomegranate tree at Migra. Among Saul's men was Ahijah the priest who was wearing the ephod, the priestly vest. Ahijah was the son of Ichabod's brother Ahitub, son of the Phineas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord who had served at Shiloh. Now, no one realized that Jonathan had left the Israelite camp. To reach the Philistine outpost, Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sene. The cliff on the north was in front of Michmash, and the one on the south was in front of Giba. Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. Check this part out. Do what you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. Heavenly Father, God, I come before you right now, Lord Jesus. And God, I just thank you, Lord Jesus, again, Lord, for this time, for this opportunity, Lord God. And God, I just pray that you would, Lord, just move through me. Move me aside, God. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me, Lord God, that to be able to pour out your word, Lord God, the way that you have intended here tonight. God, I thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus' name, we all say, amen. So right here, what we find is we find two different armies, a whole situation basically from a movie. I'm going to be honest. When I first read this, I was like, dang, like, this is kind of dope. Like, what's going on here? And these two armies, we have one on one cliffside and one on a different cliffside. And there was one man that decided, you know what, I'm going to do something. He decided, you know what, yeah, there's a crazy army out there, and we're over here camped out, but you know what, I'm going to do something. As a matter of fact, this man, he stands up to fight. And in that moment, in my head, I could picture just lightning, just, you know what I'm saying? Just like a movie. But this story right here, it's about Jonathan. And it shows the type of man that he was. He was the type of man that didn't settle for less. He was a man of vision, a man that walked by faith. He believed in the impossible. And he was a man that was worth following because God was with him. And you know what? He had an excuse. He did. He had an excuse to not go on that side and go and do something, start something that might have been crazy in the eyes of others. But if you read 1 Samuel 13, 6, it says like this, the men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, 
and because they were hard pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. It's talking about the same battle. It might have been the chapter before, but it's the same battle a little bit before this instance. And Jonathan had a good reason to not go. He had a really good reason. Because this army that they were about to face, it was pretty big. It was pretty scary. And he was just one man that decided to do something a little bit different. That decided to step out just a little bit in faith. And he had all the reason not to go. But he chose to stand strong. The thing was, though, he didn't stand alone. His armor bearer was right there with him. And the thing with his armor bearer, he was in position. Now, the definition of an armor bearer is a person who carried the armor or weapons of a warrior. In other words, other tasks that an armor bearer may, may do is they stand beside the leader to assist, to lift him up and protect him against any enemy that might attack him. What excuse did the armor bearer have? See, look, if we back up again to chapter 13, in verse 2, you guys can go ahead and read that on your own. But in verse 2, it basically says Saul had his special troops with him at the beginning. The beginning of this battle, before they even camped up, he had his special unit with him. Matter of fact, he had 3,000 of them. But in chapter 14, we read that he only had 600 men. The elite. The elite were with him. Those that were experienced, those that, that had been tested and proven, they were the ones that were with him from the beginning. But they were the ones that were fleeing. Because we see the numbers change from 3,600. That tells me that these people were in fear. These people, they, they, they felt like, man, they, I don't know if we can do this. They had their doubts. And they were the ones that were the experienced ones. But the thing was this. Was that their previous victories wasn't going to get them to this next one. It wasn't enough. And yet they leaned on it so much that when they saw the, the opposing army, they said, no, nah, this can't be done. And so most of them left. But what they failed to do is they failed to have the faith to believe in the future outcome. And Jonathan's armor bearer, yeah, he had a reason not to trust. But the difference was that he knew his leader. He knew the man that he was following. And in order to know your leader, you know what? You got to spend some time with him. And he himself must know you. Jonathan knew he could trust his armor bearer because of the relationship he had. Because he decided to stick with him every opportunity that he could. He had the excuse. All those other warriors and their armor bearers. They're running, they're hiding, they're going into caves. But not him. Why? Because he knew that there was a man that he could trust. And his armor bearer, matter of fact, he would have missed a great opportunity to back up his leader if he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He would have missed the call to go. Sometimes something happens, matter of fact. When you spend time with your leader, something happened. Something happened right there whenever he spent time with his leader. When he was with him, he could tell. He could tell just from how he acted from his response that every time he got close to him, he, he got imparted into. Every time he was right there with him, there was words that were flying at him that, that, that had to do with God, that had to do with the army, that had to do with having faith in, in who he himself trusted. And as we ourselves begin to stick to our leaders, Something begins to happen. You begin to talk like they do. You begin to walk like they do. You begin to believe just like they do. You begin to see the vision just like your leaders do. You gain their heart. And though Jonathan had the armor bearer, yeah, two completely different levels. One was an experienced warrior. The other one was carrying his armor. They had one thing in common, and that was that they shared the same Heart. Now heart is for their people. But 
that armor bearer, he knew that he had a position. He knew he had a role to play. And that role that he had to play was to be at his post. And his post was to be right there backing up his leader. Right there backing up the one that was going to take him to victory. When I read that, I just think about myself. I'm like, man, that just, that encourages me. That tells me what I got to do. I got to stick to my post. I got to stick to my leaders. I got to stick to Mario. I got to stick to Jay. I got to stick to Abish. I got to stick to Pastor. It just makes me reflect. And I have a question. How will we be found? Will we be found just like the rest of the camp? Staying at home, staying where it's comfy? Or taking our place in the ministry? Just taking our post where our leader will be expecting and hoping to find us. So the thing was that Jonathan, what he did that is that he led him somewhere, right? Now, if when you read this word, the, the word says that, that there was two cliffs that they had to go through. They had to go down one and up another. There was a ravine. There was a ravine in between where they were and where that land that they were meant to conquer was. And Jonathan, he took one look at this situation and he's like, oh, yeah, I'm the man for this. He's like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what's, what's going to take place. He took a look at the impossible and he decided, I, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. And you know what? That's not what's supposed to happen. If you look at history, if you look at the, the, the history of warfare, small armies, they're not supposed to conquer big armies. By this rule's logic, if you have more men, you have more of a chance to win. But Jonathan knew something. Something that even the armor bearer himself knew because of how close he was. That was that they didn't just have an army. They had a God. A God that said, no, that you guys are meant to go somewhere more. You guys are meant to go even further out than where you guys see yourself now. And that armor bearer, he took the faith of his leader and he made it his own. He decided, I'm not going to just stay settled. No, I see where that man is taking me. And I know that there's something crazy in front of me. He was looking at that ravine. He was probably wondering, my God, I got to climb that. I got to go up that. And I bet you he even felt a little bit of fear because when they were at the bottom of that ravine, there was something that happened. There was the people that saw him, and they weren't friendly. The enemy saw them coming. See, when you guys are about to hit your promised land, the enemy takes notice. They see you right there. Right at the place where you can just take that. Well, all you got to do is take that leap of faith and climb. Go after your leader who's already climbing right, at, right in front of you. And he's looking at you and, he, and, and, the, and the enemy's saying, you want a piece of this? He's going to challenge. So don't count it strange. Don't count it funny when all of a sudden that person hits you up. Don't count it funny when all of a sudden a bunch of craziness starts happening in your life. Don't, th don't think it's weird that these things are, are, are happening, that there's sicknesses happening in you and your family. Don't think it's weird. Because all the devil is doing, all the enemy is doing is giving you the opportunity to have an excuse. That's all he's doing. And you know, all he's doing is sitting there and waiting. That's the thing. He's sitting there and he's, he's waiting. Because in reality, he can't touch you. In reality, he knows the God that you serve. He knows the God that we serve. And all he can do is spit a few words. And all that armor bearer had to do was look at his leader. And he said, you know what, if he's climbing up there, I can too. If he has the faith to do it and go fight, I can too. And that's exactly what they did. In 1 Samuel 14, 13 and 14, it says, so they climbed up using both hands and feet. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer 
killed those who came behind them. They killed some 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about half an acre. That right there, that's backing up your leader. Jonathan, what he did is he created an opportunity, an opportunity for the rest of the army to go ahead and go forward, but he couldn't do it alone. He needed somebody to have his back. There's no way he could have moved on from one person if he knew that there wasn't somebody he could trust, somebody that he could count on that was right behind him. Yeah, he was striking every single person that was coming at him. But in order for him to move on, he needed to make sure that, okay, this person is taking care of what I already slew. This person is taking care of what's already down and dead. He's handling that. Now let me go face this next thing. And as that armor bearer was following him, I can imagine his faith of what was about to take place just grew even more and even more. As he saw his leader go forward and, 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 and in courage and in faith, he saw him and he was, you know what, we can do this. We can do this, he said. See, God's given us, us, this church, a shepherd. A shepherd full of vision. He's given us a shepherd that's full of faith. Our pastor, man, he pushed. He prayed for the opportunity that we ourselves, that we find ourselves in. He pushed for it. He talked about it a lot of the time. Now it's time for us to believe. It's time for us to say, you know what? Pastor, I see what you're trying to climb. Pastor, I see that, that, that with every single time that, that, that you speak it out, that there's a victory in store. That there's a victory and a possibility for us to achieve something that we've never had before. There's an opportunity that's there. Now, I encourage you guys to read this story. Starting from chapter 13 all the way to 14. I encourage you. Because it's a powerful story. It shows you what exactly King Saul was like, and it showed you exactly how Jonathan was and how his armor bar be bearer was willing to follow. Now, with Saul, though, he hesitated. Him and the rest of the army, they hesitated. And that was because he doubted. He was unsure of the outcome. If you read it, you'll see that there was an opportunity for him to, to encourage the people. To encourage, but he didn't take it. He didn't do it. That was because he himself didn't believe. Now, the other day I had a conversation with Pastor. And in that conversation, it led to my giving towards this pledge. And in this, he said one thing that, that man, it still sticks with me today. And what he said was that boys become men when they have their Red Sea moment. It stuck with me. Matter of fact, it still sticks with me today. I was like, dang. Pastor called me a boy. No, that's not what he was doing. What he was doing was he was trying to make me see, like, look, where you're at is your Red Sea moment. Church, we're at a Red Sea moment. We're at an opportunity where we can either have the faith to believe in the impossible, where we can have the faith to believe that if we just take a step, something can happen. Or, or we could choose to stay comfortable where we are and do nothing. And after Pastor told me that, I was like, dang, I don't want to stay that way. I want to be able to stand on this and say that, you know what, Pastor, I backed you up. Pastor, I believe in what you believe in. Pastor, I see where you're trying to take us. And you know what, I want to put my full heart into this. I want to put everything I am because I know that the man that God has put in charge of my life is not just trying to take opportunity. No, he's trying to take care. He's trying to nurture. He's trying to raise us up, raise me up to be a man of God that I never thought I could ever be. And what it takes is trusting. Trusting. And this is going to take for all of us to trust. Jeremiah 3.15 3, says, and I will give you shepherds 
after my own heart, who will guide you with knowledge and understanding. God's given us a shepherd. God's given us a shepherd who's willing to hear us, who's willing to fight for us, to pray for us, to stand on this pulpit, behind this pulpit, and to give us something that we can believe in, something that we can live for, something that we can hold on to, and know that that promise is not just pastors. It's yours. It's mine. See, when this building becomes Victor H. Stockton's, it's going to be for exactly that, all of Stockton. That means that your family is going to come here. That means that salvation is going to take place within this city. That means that Stockton doesn't have to be a statistic anymore. That means that Stockton doesn't have to be in one of the most dangerous cities list anymore. Instead, Stockton can be known as a place where revivals took out. Revival broke out. Where God had put his hand on the specific people that just chose to believe, chose to say yes, chose to follow after a man with vision. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, miracles were poured out. That's the opportunity that God has given us here. Heavenly Father, God, I come before you right now, Lord Jesus. And God, I pray, Lord, that you, Lord God, would just move within your people's heart, God. That, God, that we would know, Lord, that it is you, God, that we are following. It is you, Lord God, that have established the leaders, Lord God, that are over us, taking care of us, praying for us, fighting for us, God. And I just pray, Lord God, that we would have the faith, Lord God, to stand strong alongside those, Lord God, that are standing strong for us. Thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity, Lord Jesus. Give you all the praise and all the worship here, Lord God. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen, amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Man. Come on. God is doing something in this place here tonight. You know, I also count it an honor and privilege to be back here as well. I want to thank our pastor, Pastor Carlos Cena, for entrusting me to be behind here. All the leaders who have poured into my life. You know, Pastor Ruben, Mario, Abishai, Jay. You know, dealing with me when I went in the home and and I, I, I really wanted to do my own thing. But it's because a ministry like this was able to take a man like me and work with me, you know, because of the instructions and the order that was given to them, I'm able to be right here right now. I want to thank my daughter who's here with me tonight. Come on. <laughs> One of the two were able to come tonight. The other one's uh, practicing her basketball career or baseball career tonight. No, <laughs> but softball. But my oldest has honestly been through uh, a whole lot with me. You know, she's she's probably experienced the, the most of everything with me, uh, good and bad. You know, but she's stuck through it. You know, we've, ha we've had our uh, shares of ups and downs. But God has brought us all through. You know, God has brought us all through. It's all, all because of him. Come on. If we can all stand right now tonight, we're going to open up in a word, a prayer. We're going to read the scripture. If you guys want to turn your guys' Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. And we're going to be reading verses 8 through 13. And see, I know that God's going to do something here tonight because this message, it might sound like somewhat what you just heard and it's not a coincidence because that's the way God works and it's not like Jason and I uh, coerced the messages together you know he had his time to study and do his message you know and I had to separate and do mine um, the title of my message tonight is called count on me see God wants to be able to count on you and if you're one of them people that say, you know, I can be counted on, I want to hear you say, count on me. Come on, say it again. 
Amen. We're going to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you here tonight. We just thank you for what you're about to do. I pray that you set me aside, that I decrease, that you increase. Have your Holy Spirit just flood this place. We honor you in everything that we do. Father God, I pray that this word go forth the way you put it on my heart. That it fall on fertile soil, Father God, that we do not leave this place the same. We thank you for the message that you have given Jason to. And we know that you're in this place and we know that it's all working in alignment with what you want here for us tonight. We just honor you and we glorify you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. The word of God reads, it says, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go out and fight the army of Amalek. It says, for us tomorrow, I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Amalek. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the uh, nearby hill. It says, as long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amalekites gained the advantage. It says, Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. It says, so Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on, and they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. It says, so his hands held steadily until sunset, as a result... Joshua overwhelmed the army of Amalek in battle. Amen. You guys may take your seats here tonight. I just want to give you guys a little picture of what's going on during this time. Right before this battle started to take place, the people of Israel were complaining. They were complaining to Moses because they were dying of thirst. How many are thirsty here tonight? Oh, come on. I don't want to hear you complaining. No. <laughs> they, were, they were dying of thirst. And they were like, give us some water. And we all know that Moses had a staff that carried power. It was the same staff that he was able to split the Red Sea, part the sea, deliver uh, the Israelites out of Egypt. So God gave him a specific command to be able to strike a rock. And said, go strike that rock. And water will come gushing out of it. Everybody's thirst was quenched. Then comes this battle. And see, what I want to focus on when it comes to this battle is when Jason was talking about Jonathan and his armor bearer. Do you notice in that scripture that they referred him to armor bearer? They didn't even give him a name. See, too many times we get caught up on, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know my name. When Jason was reading that scripture, it hit me. I'm like, man, they didn't even recognize him. But he was the one that helped change the game. But his name didn't need to be mentioned because he knew his position. See, when you know your position, you already know your name carries weight. You already know that you're written in the book. You already know you're going to be part of history because you know the position that you play. See, when this battle took place, Joshua was given a command to choose some men. And I don't know about you, but I've been in some complaining stages where I don't want to do anything. We're all like, no, no, I don't want to. So if they just came out of a complaining stage, that water must have been very good for Joshua to be able to grab up some men. And they were like, you know, well, well yeah, we're, we're going to war. Let's go. Because we want some more of that water. See, because we got to know that they saw a visual of what God can do. Not of what man can do, but what God can do. See, we need to be a people now these days to be able to man our position, whether it be at your job, whether it be in your household, whether it be here in the house of God, 
whether it be in your community, because you're going to be the last reflection of who Christ is. You're going to be the reflection of who Christ is in the community. When people say, because nowadays we know that a lot of Christians have stigmas. Oh, well, why do I want to go to church? They're just all hypocrites. Why, why do you even want to go? They're all talking about each other. You can change the narrative. You have the power to change the narrative. See, my desire is coming out of the home. I knew that I would have to eventually go out to the real world and handle and take care of what was to come for my life. But one of my truest desires was to be able to say, God, you have placed me in a position now to be able to be a reflection of who you are. So when I go into this world, let them see who you are. I don't, I don't, I don't want them to see who I am because who I am will mess things up, I promise you. I'll, I'll ruin it real quick. I, I start doing things my way, it, it, it's going to be a disaster. You can ask my daughter. She, she, she went through it. She spent a lot of years without me. That it wasn't pretty. In and out of her life. But when I allowed God and stood my position and said, I want Christ to reflect who I am, she has her father in her life. <laughs> See, but we need to know our position and not leave our post. See, God is looking for a people who you can look at and say, oh, yeah, they're there. They're there. When you wonder why certain people have a certain favor or they're like being elevated, sometimes we get too busy like, well, why did they choose them? Well, maybe it's because they've been visible. Maybe it's because they've been at their position. They've been at their post. See, in this story with Moses, we can see it's very significant that Moses had the staff. And there was a story the other day that I got to hear, and I, I love listening to history, loving uh, about our ministry. You know, there was a story that I heard uh, from Pastor Ed, well, not from Pastor Ed, but from Gil and Michelle about Pastor Ed, about a sermon that he gave one time. And if you guys don't know who Pastor Ed, Pastor Ed's a, one of the reasons why we're here in Northern California, Victory Outreach. Come on, pioneer. And he said he gave an illustrated sermon where he put bars on, on the chairs. And then depending on however you came to sit, you know how some people like to sit in their favorite seats. You know, would depend on if you had a bar or not. And then he, everybody who had a bar in their chair that would come up to the stage and they would have to hold it up. The whole time they're holding it up, people started to get weak, putting their arms down. And the moral of the story was to see who can hold the bar up the longest is that they had everybody in the crowd watching them and not one person got up to lift anybody's arms. See, I don't know about you, but as a Christian, we're not called to be spectators. We're not called just to watch on the sidelines. We're called to put our hands to the plow. We're called to say, you know what, okay. I'm going to go to the war. I'm going to be the one that you can choose. I'm going to be the one that you can count on to go to battle. Because when it's war time, I don't want to be right there like Jason was saying, where are they at? I, I, I can't do that. I, I, I've lost too, too many losses in my life. And I came too far to ever go back. See, I love right here because Joshua is giving him the command. Joshua took his people, they fought the fight. But the best thing is Aaron and her knew their positions. They could have went to the battle too, you know, but they knew their position. They ended up going up to the mountain with Moses. See, the other day we had a rally. I'm going to be honest with you. I've seen a lot of rallies that we've done. Probably nothing like the one we just had. Probably nothing like the one we just had. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. It was because you had a people who went out there and knew their position. Not one person was out of line. Everybody flowed. The community was truly blessed. But everybody played their role. 
everybody played their role. It was beautiful. <laughs> See, so when something happens, when people know their positions and know their role, something great is taking place. Something great is taking place. So your first point on this message is take up your position. Second point is we need to follow the assignment. We need to follow the assignment. Too many times do we have the assignment that we want to do. We have our own agenda. Trust me, I came in the home and I only wanted to do 30 days. Oh, hallelujah. Two and a half years later, who knows, it had to be God's assignment. Come on. 30 days I told the Lord, I said, that's all I'm going to do. I just need to get clean. You know, I just need to get healthy because I was like a buck 20 soaking wet. It was horrible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. See, but it had to be the Lord's plan and not mine. See, God has a plan for your life. See, when they're able to follow the instructions during this battle, you notice they started gaining the, the, the upper hand on the Amalekites. So let me give you a little story about the Amalekites too. They used to kill people for fun. This is what they did. They were experienced at it. They loved it. When people went into that, the, 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 the area of that desert, they used to just love to pluck them out. They got their goods. They were like, we're just going to kill them for fun. They loved it. This is what they were good at. Just imagine going into a battlefield with, with, with some green berets or some Navy SEALs. You're not going to win. See, but Joshua didn't second guess the plan. Joshua said, okay, well, because, you know, when people have reputation in the streets, you're like, man, I don't even want to go there. They, they're, they're about their business. I don't even want to mess with that side of town. I don't, I don't even want to go there. They had to hear about the Amalekites. They were like, man, these guys, you know, they're, they're good at war. They, they have no problem. They'll, they'll kill you. But Joshua stood to the plan. He stuck to the plan. It didn't matter what the, what the odds may have looked like. It didn't matter what the fear may have tried to come in and settle in. He said, you know what? No. We have given instructions. We're going to go in there. We're going to fight them. Aaron and her were armor bearers. We're talking about armor bearers. He said, you know what? Okay, as long as Moses' hands are standing up, as long as his hands are up, we're good. We're going to have the advantage over this. See, the reason why Moses stood at the top of the hill is just to prove one point. See, Moses could have raised his staff anywhere. See, but when he stood at the top of the hill, everybody, everybody was able to see him. That the power was coming from God, not him. See, the power has to come from God. We have to understand that. That the power never comes from us. That the power comes from God, and God is the only one that's going to be able to deliver you out of any situation. See, but he uses a people like us to fight those battles, though. See, Nehemiah had a plan. God gave him the, the okay, specific instructions. The wall was built. Many great stories in the Bible talks about when you follow instructions, your life will be truly blessed. blessed. Hebrews 13, 17 is a scripture that always stuck in my heart. It stuck in my heart because I know that my life does not belong to me. And I'm going to paraphrase it, but it says that you need to obey your spiritual leaders. See, you need to obey your spiritual leaders, but too many times we get too caught up. Obey? Obedience doesn't sit right with us. Because we're a people that, that, that didn't like to, to obey anything. We disobeyed the law. We disobeyed our mama, our, our daddies, whoever it may be. We weren't listening to nobody. So when we hear that we need to obey, something starts to happen with inside of us. See, but let's, let's, let's keep going on with that scripture. It says, for they hold an account for you. So what you tripping for? 
What you tripping for? They ain't holding the count for you. All you do is got to obey. See, you don't need a trip. Oh, well, they're telling me what to do. They're telling me how to do this, how to do that. Don't worry about it. It's good. God says in his word, hey, listen, they ain't holding accountable for your life. They know what they're doing. So if anything happens, they have to hold an account. But trust that God has placed them in your life to be able to drive you in the way that God called you to go, in the direction that God wants your life to go. <laughs> Rest of that scripture says, do this to give them much joy. To give them much joy, not to be a burden, because it's not going to be a benefit for you. You start being disobedient and, and not, not, not doing anything, trust me. Man, Jay, thank you, Jay. Thank you for always loving on me, no matter what. <laughs> thank you, Jay. There was plenty of times I should have probably been kicked out of the house. I, I, I promise you, I probably, I probably didn't bring a lot of joy. Man, but God's grace and mercy, man. God's grace and mercy. My last point for this message is that we need to see the need and meet the need. We need to see the need and meet the need. See, too many times we're waiting for people to call on us. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. I, I, I've dealt with that. And I, you know, I'm starting to make some changes because I don't want to be the one that somebody has to call on. I want to be the one doing calling. Hey, what do you need? Hey, let's go. Are we going to do this? Are we going to do that? See, during this battle, you guys seen Aaron and her. When Moses' arms got tired and they got weak, when the battle, everything became too heavy, they saw the need. They didn't have to wait for Moses to ask them, hey, I'm getting tired. I can't do this anymore. I need, I need you guys. They saw the need. They found the rock. They said, hold on. And they didn't bring Moses to the rock. They took the rock to him. See, they took the rock to him. And think about, it. we ain't talking probably any, any rock. You're talking two guys, probably a big old boulder. I don't know about you, but that's going to take some strength. Say, don't worry. We got you. You stay right there. You keep holding up that staff. I don't care how heavy it gets, but we're on our way. We see the need, we're on our way, and we're going to meet it. And they said after, I mean, I would have probably already been exhausted lifting that boulder up. But it, right after, they got on each side of his arms and started lifting up his arms. See, I don't know about you, things get heavy sometimes. I do need some people to, to, to lift up my arms sometimes. I'm glad that I got a team around me when things do get heavy that I can call on. You know, but they see, I mean, Jay's real good. Jay, thank you again. Pastor, thank you for watching. Love you guys. These are great men of God who just see, call out of nowhere. Hey, what's going on? You good? See, we need that. You guys need to be that to somebody else as well. See, we're in a time where we're entering the promised land. We can get the keyboard up. See. During this time, as the war was happening, you know, there's probably new, new, newborn babies. There's generations who didn't see a lot of the murmuring and complaining that happened throughout the years. You know, and they got to experience the promised land. The same time that this is taking place is around the same time our church here. Is about to enter the promised land. See, not a lot of people, there's people who've been here, who've seen all the murmuring complaints, seen the, seen the doubt, seen the fear, seen the things that happened, but they still stood strong. And there's some who are just new, they say, you know what is going on, what's taking place, we don't know, but hey, you know what, whatever you guys got going on, we're right there with you, let's do it. Come on, I know it's a people like you. You guys can all stand here tonight. See, when there's a need, every need needs to be met. The city of Stockton is in need. This city right here is in need. 
of a people like you to be able to go share the love of God to them. See, you're here for a reason. It's because God's already doing something in your life. But it just doesn't end right here. See, not only does the city have a need, but this county, this state, and so does the rest of this world. See, we have a lot of women who are in Guadalajara right now because there's a need that needs to be met. They're out there getting equipped. They're out there getting their, their marching orders. Because when they come back, they know that there's a need that needs to be met. And they're going to be deployed. We have mighty men coming up. Men, are you going to take your positions? Are you going to get your marching orders? Are you going to go and get equipped? Because there's a world that needs us. Coming up, we have evangelism. And I know we have a lot of things going on in our life, trust me. We just need to start prioritizing. We start move, moving some things around for the people who are hurting and dying out there in those streets. You and I, we, we, we have the love of Christ. We've already experienced it. I encourage you guys here tonight, whether it was my message whether it's Jason's message that moved you. I know that God's doing something. God's touching the heart of his people. See, this is a, this is a season where our pastor is going to need us. This is a season where he's going to need armor bearers. This is a season where Sister Athena, his wife, are going to need armor bearers. This is a season where us leaders... Mario, he's going to need armor bearers to help impart in this next generation. It's in this season where Abishai, but the evangelism ministry, is going to need armor bearers to be able to go hit these streets and make a difference. It's in this season where Pastor Reuben is going to need armor bearers as him and Sister Nancy pour in to our married couples. As they have their house fires, they're pouring into this next generation as well. tonight. I want to encourage you guys to come to this altar here. Altars are open here tonight.